thank you for coming tonight. My um, journey in preparation for this program has been kind of very interesting and um, one that I have enjoyed. It's been challenging and, and simply because it, uh, it involves a topic that I've had no preparation for. And it basically started with my wife and I driving past this little postage-sized cemetery on the way to Lonsdale and, not, and wondering, well, who was buried? Oh, well, it must be a, a bunch of Bohemians, right? <laughs> on the way to Lonsdale, which is a Bohemian community, and from Vesely, and of course, New Prague. But surprisingly, it's one layer upon a layer upon another layer upon another layer that I'm going to share with you with a totally different ethnic group. I guess I also became interested in this because, not that I'm sick of bohemianness, <laughs> but I don't have a lot of time left. And I thought, well, I need to kind of exercise the mind a bit and kind of chase away that dementia that everyone talks about that's been subject to. And not that I have it, but uh, I don't have any, well, I should talk to my wife. But it's, uh, I wanted to challenge myself with something that I really am passionate about. Joseph Nicollet uh, came up the Mississippi River in 1843 and entered into the Minnesota River, which is called St. Peter River. And he created a detailed map of the entire region. And it was published by the US government. And his map was really the first attempt to produce an accurate map of this area, including Scott County. So he arrived on the Minnesota River at the mouth of Sand Creek, you know, the one that flows across Highway 19. Some days it's called Voshko's Creek or whoever's land bordered it. It had an entirely different name. At the mouth of this creek, um, where it flows into the Minnesota River, was the little village of the Sandbar. And so when Nicola had arrived at that mouth of that uh, creek, um, all of his French entourage came down with violent fever due to the, the hordes of gnats that bit them along the way. So he entitled and gave the name Rapids of the Fever to the Sand Creek. So now we have a new name and to embrace and understand why it ended up on his map. So the first uh, settlers, of course, as you probably have read or know, they came up to Shock came to Shakopee first, and then they followed 169. At that time, it was an Indian trail that led to Jordan, and joined then the Sand Creek and came into the New Prague area. Understanding the Native American community is uh, tapping into the accounts and written uh, history of families. Matthias Philip, who was Anton Philip's son came in 1931 to revisit our community and um, published in the 75th edition of the New Prague Times. He commented on his family and the fact that the Indians outnumbered the whites. Probably no surprise. They didn't cause the settlers any trouble, although they were continually begging for food. Father used to go hunting with them and they would let him have all the meat he wanted, but they never any of the skins from deer, bears, or other animals. Remember, there were wolves roaming in this area, too. My mother became ill when I was a very small baby, and a young, quote-unquote, squaw, as we know as an Indian indigenous woman, nursed me. The squaw Indian gave me my first bath in the cold water of the creek. What a beautiful image of, of a bridging ethnic um, ethnic uh, differences by the native woman embracing the white woman's child. Now, we all know about immigrants. It's in the news every day and on our borders. And part of the e experience of being an immigrant is language barriers. My oldest aunt was raised in a Swedish community 
in uh, near uh, Lowry, Minnesota. When she came to join my grandmother in Minneapolis around 1895, she only spoke English, uh, Swedish. And the kids made fun of her at school because she could not speak English. Now, remember, Minneapolis was the melting pot of all Norwegian and Scandinavian ethnic groups and people. And so this is something that continues even today. The first group of Bohemians ran into this language barrier, too, by knocking down the door of Anton Philip, not knowing German and he not knowing Bohemian. They simply made it the sign of the cross, sign language, and then they were able to join a meal and then life went on as we know it today. Now settlers had many different stories as I told you and one of the things that was common in all these was the Native Americans desire for food. Now they were they were hungry, their lands had been, had been uh, impacted by white settlement and the amount of wild game was de being depleted and knowing the Bohemians and the Germans in the area reasons why they left Europe was because they were also hungry. They did not have always have food to feed their children and their families. A lot of them were sharecroppers. They had to share a large percentage of their, their crop with the individual who owned the property. So there was a commonality in that regard. And the settlers did share their food. Knowing that the Native Americans have built into their culture sharing, they generally returned to the, the home where food was given to them and replaced it with maybe a deer, uh, they, a carcass of a deer or other food that they had gathered. So in their giving society, they always uh, gave back to the settlers in our community. Indians also, also as you know, in stories that you'll find in uh, the book that I have placed up here, they ate from one bowl. There are numerous stories that Tom Kyer has gathered from in individual recollections of settlers that um, they often startled the settlers. These stories seem to be passed down from generation to generation and family to family because this was a group of people that was totally foreign to the white settlers that, they were, that uh, they were commonly engaged with. Math Matthias uh, Kyer, Tom's great-grandfather, often left on trips, hunting trips and so on. And uh, one day, a group of Native Americans showed up at the door. And uh, of course, it startled Grandma Kyer. And uh, she gave them bread and butter, shared that with them. And they walked out to the garden area and pulled up some beets and ate them raw and then went away without a word. Excuse me. Frank Mertz, a merchant on Main Street, he came from the Heidelberg area and uh, the old chameleon, uh, it's next to West End Liquor, which is now an events, a little event center, was the place in business where he eventually prospered. But in 1865, he built a log home where Marquardt Jewelry is located. And that home, that store that is, he traded primarily with the Native Americans in the surrounding area of New Prague. They, he, tra he traded food for hides, beaver, deer, mink, anything that walked or crawled that they could trap, which they were comfortable in sharing he traded for, for food, and they were then able to eat. East of New Prague was the Nick Daleiden home. Now, if you know where Parkview Med Medical Clinic is, that was the whole home of Nick Daleiden. And he was, I believe, was a Luxembourger. And um, maybe some of you had his uh, granddaughter, Anne Daleiden, for a second grade teacher. Did you have her for a second grade teacher? Anyway, Nick DeLayden built a two-story uh, sandstone schloss. That's what they called this home, a big, big home. But prior to that era, era in which he built that, he could see Indian lodges out his front door to the east, bordering Sand Creek. And uh, he often saw them hunting. 
and later he commented, they later moved to the St. Patrick neighborhood. Now why in the blazes would they ever move to St. Patrick? <laughs> it wasn't because of the tavern, right? And the church, because <laughs> but in that neighborhood, there was another Indian village close to the Pomier farm, which is north of St. Patrick Church. St. Patrick was often called T.P. Hill. Many artifacts have been found on the Pomier farm. A trail led from St. Patrick west through the Novotny, Donna Novotny's family farm, because they have found many artifacts, eventually ended up in front of Ace Hardware, through the golf course, up Halinka's, did I pronounce that right? Halinka's, I always get my wife and her bohemian, back Halinka's Hill, through the Francis Perotka farm, the first farm to the west as you uh, travel on 13 toward Montgomery. Francis told me one time when I was picking up eggs that the Indian trail could still be seen in the woods to the west of the family dwellings. That trail eventually led to the area where the Jan farm, I don't know if I pronounced that, Jan farm or J-A-H-N farm. Now I had the, the, many of the John kids in school when I was teaching and uh, one of them brought a, the collection of arrowheads and Cantalonite Indian pipe, a pipe bowl to class to share with me. So this kind of triggered, again, an interest in the stories. And I, I think stories are the best way to understand history. In any event, they, uh, before she passed away, uh, Ella John told me the story of how the Native Americans uh, lived on a rise above their farm, overlooking kind of a marshy, kind of a little lake. And every spring, when Ella's husband and her husband's grandfather would plow, they would find Indian artifacts. The story also that uh, was interesting uh, relayed to me was the fact that at the time of the settlement of this, uh, the uh, farm, the um, Native American women would bring their squash and their pumpkins down to the farm and put them in the hot coals and embers of tree stumps that the John family was burning as they were clearing their land. Then this trail led a little bit further, ended up near Heidelberg, and eventually at a traverse to Sioux in St. Peter. There was very little that I have found that really had any um, indication there was any difficulty with the Native American uh, community in, in surrounding New Prague. They all got along, they all depended upon another. And interesting enough that I found that in the 1860 census there were 172 white females, 138 white females, and Indians. Amab Moran and Pierre Felix were the, and their families were the ones that were part of those 11 Native American individuals. Now Frank Moran, uh, you know, this is just uncanny, he lived down the road from us on the old Vesely Road across from Rademacher, Sally and uh, Greg Rademacher's. And uh, when we were first, uh, there was a dirt road and we'd meander down there uh, and explore the countryside. And we'd often see Frank kind of darting behind the barn, which was on the west side on a precipice, living on the east side in this very simple home, clad with metal. And when he died in, in 2000, I was able to uh, approach a relative and photograph that house as the tin was removed, revealing its logs structure underneath. The individual who restored our log house in the park purchased that building, fortunately, and sent the logs out to Montana and to a family that were going to incorporate it into their home. Anyway, Frank Moran was born in 2000, um, 1903, excuse me, died in 2000, and he was essentially a recluse and he lived with his sister. His father was Amab Moran Jr. He was born in 1855 
and uh, lived until 1925. And, and he married Teresa Kamish from Vesely. And he was born in Vesely in 1864. His grandfather, again, the name he carried through the family line, was Amab Moran. And he, this is Moran, what, uh, individual, his great grand, his grandfather was born in 1803 in Quebec. And he married Angelique Skaya. Now, we had Skaya's living next to us when we moved into the country, but they were Finnish. They were kind of Indians, too. The kids were, at least. But not <laughs> the same Skaya family. And uh, Angelique was part of the Kaposhia. Did I pronounce that right? Where is my... K-A-P-O-S-I-A. Did I pronounce that correctly? Kaposha? Kaposhia? Uh, community. And uh, they were married in Mendota. And uh, Father Raveau, who was the missionary to all the area Native American communities along the Minnesota and the Mississippi River, uh, married them, and they, the, the marriage was witnessed by two men, which I'll tell you about a little bit later. Anyway, this, this Amab Moran was uh, received land in 1856. They had 15 children. I have those photographs of that building. I was going to bring it, but I couldn't find it. And uh, the 1865, and the, uh, when this individual, Marguerite Moran was born, one of these 15 children, she was listed as a Minwakanton Sioux. So again, we tie in this Native American community, and we go one step, one step further, one generation previous to this is Toma, who was Chief Betchi. And he was a member of Wabasha's band, and the Red Wing Band, and translated is, well, one reference, it was, his name was translated as the Rising Moon or the One-Eyed Sioux. You take your pick, I don't really know. But it never get the natives, the native, the chiefs, and the Native American languages. All the naming of themselves is so absolutely beautiful. They just, you know, absolutely Susan and Nancy. My God, where do they pick those names? But these had beautiful, beautiful names and names that you would just like to have. I don't know what mine would be, but big fat something. Anyway, <laughs> so. But this uh, chief, Bet the Sioux chief Betchi, um, was part of the a treaty in the signing over of the land on which Fort Snelling stands. And uh, he signed that uh, along with Zebulon Pike. His great grand, and, and uh, Mar uh, Frank Moran's great grandmother was Sky Young. Am I boring you? Now, <laughs> surprisingly, this little postage sized cemetery that I began telling you about. Uh, the St. Louis French Catholic Cemetery is located on Highway 28 on the way to Lonsdale. And it was established as a mission church by this Father Revolt that I mentioned married, who married Amab Sr. and Skaya. And uh, the cemetery it was established in 1865. Now, I often have conjured an imagery and wondered, well, how did they get to this postage size cemetery, how do they end up there? And it was because on Cody Lake, which is south of the cemetery, it was an Indian village and a very early Indian village. The Kalina family, who, Bohemian family, who bought, purchased this property, uh, I think it was Steve, you told me, they came in with a couple of galvanized buckets for the arrowheads to show you. So this community had been there. Now they didn't produce this over they produced this over many, 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 many years and many decades. And these have all been um, cataloged at the University of Minnesota. Um, but um, there was an established Indian community when the first settlers of French um, Canadians and their indigenous uh, Indian wives came to this area. They remember that the, the and I tried to do, understand how you know being a totally a kind of a I should say um, a knowing about this whole community. They must have come up with the Cannon River from the 
Prairie Island area, just a little bit north of Red Wing. And then they came to eventually to Faribault, and then to Shieldsville, and then from Shieldsville, which is they often in references to the have I have read that Cannon River ends, but it doesn't end. It ends south of Montgomery. I remember taking a bunch of art students when I had one summer out to this farm, to a grandparent's farm, looking for arrowheads, would you know. And so um, they, I was told by the Bohemian family, the Tuma family, that this is where the, actually the Cannon River began. Also, there was a Dodd Road, and Dodd Road started in St. Paul, but it, it meandered through the south and ended up near uh, Shieldsville as well. The transition from uh, fur trading and hunting animals for, to make a living to farming is an interesting story, basically based on treaties where whites tried to get the Native Americans to assimilate, taking them and reframing them and to molding them in their own vision of what they should be doing, such as farming. Now, these people did farm. In fact, I was reading today about the fact how Wabasha is completely flooded, but this, these were Native American communities, and I did read today where a lot of their crops were decimated during the spring by floods. Something has changed. So they were used to farming, but in an entirely different manner. Piece by piece, land was taken from these individuals, and they were placed on reservations, and the lifestyle that they've been used to was completely altered. I have a land warrant that I'd like to have you look at later, and it was from a given in, in the uh, to a, in 1855 to a, a young Indian woman called Pinny. She was a minor child of uh, a Native American woman and a warrior, and a part of a captain's company of I cannot pronounce it, so I won't bore. I won't try to try to pronounce it. There were company, there were um, volunteers during the Seminole War around 1812. And then this land was then broken up, and then in Henderson, Minnesota, this land warrant then was claimed by the Hauer family that lives out near Union Hill. So in the process of all this, these treaties, the land was broken up, land was taken from the Native Americans, and we're all sitting on their, we're all sitting on basically Native American land. And we do have in our culture and a society, what's mine is mine, but yours is mine. And that was something that, as it continues today, started even earlier in during this period in America. So the transition from fur trading to farming was, was difficult, but they all ended up near Cody Lake. And look, looking at the Bureau of Land Management, I have found where the families that are buried in the cemetery uh, had their little parcels of property. And they got them and they received this property in different ways. I was made more aware of this cemetery also by the Civil War Native American Rededication Ceremony last July, uh, where the Native vets remembered and the Civil War reenactors and Ken Fly's History of the Fighting Minnesota Fifth celebrate Hercules de la Chapelle, who also fought in the Civil War in the Minnesota Fifth. Hercules Chappelle um, was um, an interesting character and decidedly his placement of his burial was lost, but this group recreated a tombstone and rededicated it and Hercules Chappelle was a very young man and came back to live next door to his sister and his sister is buried next to where this tombstone is now placed. Hercules was a French Canadian, he was a Dakota Civil War veteran, and he died of TB. And so one of the reasons why he came back to this area. Native American wives were very advantageous during this period. So in my study in, in identifying the people buried in the cemetery, um, to have a Native American wife uh, was helped to strengthen your kinship. They, they had, uh, the, the Native American community was very well connected. And um, it also helped as part of their fur trading um, business, so to speak. The Hudson, Play, Hudson Bay Company uh, frowned on intermarriage. 
but the Northwest Fur Company approved intermarriage to Métis. The, if you put it a Z at the end, which is really silent, and is a French pronunciation, but Métis were half, were half breeds. They were half French Canadian and half indigenous. So some of the more interesting occupants that I found in the cemetery were, were Amab Crispin, who was in the Second Military Cavalry, fought during the Civil War. Hercules Lambert, he received an 1870 Indian allotment. His, he was indicated belonging to the, the tribe of the Sioux and centered in Red Wing. Remember the allotment was that the purpose was to wrest control of, of reservation land away from American Indians. So as you look at some of the background of these individuals, oftentimes it'll indicate how they got the land. Lake Cody was a result of Patrick Cody. He was also part Native American, and he received his land through the Scrip Warren Act of 1855. Even though he was Irish, he, he uh, born in Ireland, somehow he ended up in Canada and became part of that community. The first post office in Lake Cody, where the Peeper Farm is now located, uh, was in 1856. And he observed many times, it is, is noted, Indians traveling west to the lower agency. So the Cody Lake and this Indian trail from Shieldsville leading to Traverse to Sioux was a common place to navigate and to move. Remember, there were no highways, so you either had to make your own trail or you had to get in a, some type of a watercraft and travel or hike along the rivers that were <clears throat> common in the area. Another interesting individual was a Romand Petrovsky, and his wife's name was Lucy Birdsong, and she was born, is noted, in the Lucian Islands in Alaska. My Lord, I look at that caribou on the wall, and I just, just wonder how she ever ended up in Minnesota, but uh, she went, moved to St. Paul, she became a bird dealer, sold birds, and her husband lined up with furs. Another interesting group of family is the Turpin family. Now most of the Turpins are buried in Great Hunt Cemetery in Cottage Grove. It's closed. It's not open to the public, even difficult to navigate online. And, uh, but there are Turpins buried in the cemetery at, uh, that I'm referring to. Another interesting individual is Dr. Alphenard. He was born in Hungary. He and his wife uh, are both buried in the cemetery, and he was a doctor in Vesely. Who knew? <laughs> Saint Martin, the St. Martin family was also very inter interesting, and if you visit the cemetery, you'll see two black granite benches. And it kind of gives the family history in each of those benches, one of which the, kind of a, so to speak, patriarch was Angelique Plante, and um, her son was listed in adjoining her on another bench as a voyageur. So we have another layer of history. Not only do we have fur traders, but we have voyageurs. And um, two of her children are also buried next to her, Joseph and Hippolyte. Another individual I found interesting was the Plassans family. We have a high school teacher that teaches industrial arts. In fact, I visited with him today. For he was from originally from Faribault. Per and the Plassans family is listed as the, um, being on the earliest maps, as being in charge of the post office, which is across the road from the uh, Peeper Farm. Jack Fraser is probably, <clears throat> excuse me, is the most famous individual that's buried in the cemetery. Jack Fraser, or Iron Face as he's, he is called, was a friend and hunting partner of Henry Sibley and Little Crow. You'll, Little Crow is often brought in the, in the narration about the Indian Sioux uprising helping the settlers. Henry Sibley was the first governor of Minnesota. The first, he was a fur trader for the American Fur Company in Mendota along with Alexander Faribault. And you can see his home, the Mendota House, if you go to that community. He was a U.S. representative for the Minnesota Territory. He was a military leader in the Dakota War of 1862. He led an expedition into the Dakota Terri Territory excuse me, in 1863. And he was a hunting partner and friend and scout with Jack Fraser. Henry Sibley built 
the paid for the burial of Jack Fraser in 1865. He, he also bought land for Jack Fraser's wife. He also paid for Jack Fraser's tombstone, which is easily uh, found today. And um, the, he was, Jack Fraser is reputed to be the first white settler in Wheatland Township. That can be debated, but I have not found anything not to confirm that. <clears throat> Moving along, Henry Sibler published in, um, he interviewed Jack Fraser in 1857, 1858, and the story about Jack Fraser, or the man behind me in this photograph, uh, was printed in the Pioneer Press sometime later. Frank, Frank um, excuse me, Jack Fraser was born on the Bad Axe River in Wisconsin, and he was a member of the Midwakanton Santee Sioux Tribe. And the Indian agent at Fort Snelling noted that um, Jack Fraser was a very, very uh, important figure in Minnesota at that time period. And um, the Indian agent uh, created a little community with Gideon and Pond and his brother on the east side of uh, Bade Muskaya, um, which is formerly Lake Calhoun in Minneapolis. And Jack Fraser was enlisted by Gideon Pond and his brother to help with the creating of a Dakota dictionary because there was no written language for that group and there, of course as I mentioned before there was a uh, communication barrier because of uh, the inability there were no written records of the the Native Americans and their language at that time. So the first 35, 30 to 35 years <clears throat> Jack Fraser lived with the Red Wing Band of the Dakota in Red Wing. And his family are listed as consisting of one and named in the census of the Indian camp in Fort Snelling in 1862. So we have a lot of mobility. That's one thing that I have found through studying all these different individuals that they continually, continually were on the move. And uh, Jack Fraser was married at Carver, Minnesota, or Little Rapids, and then it ended up in um, Red Wing and then coming up the Cannon River to the Cody Lake settlement. And um, I found out today that um, Jack Fraser uh, claimed debts accrued during the from the or by the Midwakanton Dakota Band of 1837. He was given five thousand dollars. <throat> Soon after that, he established a trading post in St. Peter. So right on Main Street at the big bend of the river, by the levee, is where he set up his trading post. And then after that, he came to Wheatland Township. Jack Fraser's father was Joseph. He was a Scottish fur trader. His mother was Hazel de Wind, a daughter of Walking Buffalo from the Red Wing Village. And he married another Hazel de Wind, but of a little different spelling. 